So we've heard today some amazing voices um, uh, from all of our, our correspondents, from Bob, uh, from our amazing sound. Um, I'm a journalist. I do words. And so I wrote a book, um, a book about food security and climate change. It was called It's Hot Hungry Planet. It's a story we need to tell. Our next guest tells stories through pictures. And uh, they say one of those is worth a thousand words. So um, joining us now is a National Geographic contributing photographer, Katie Erlinski. She covers stories and captures images from communities on the front lines of climate change. Stories about the people and places that are too often go unnoticed. And so with thanks to National Geographic, and for making this possible. Katie, I know you're literally off the plane from the Arctic. Where are you? Um, I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to the summit. Thank you. Thank you. Press play. I swear I know how to use this. Oh, can I, and then I can do, I can go back with the, We'll start with this image, how about that? Okay, so uh, today I'm gonna share a bit from an ongoing body of work that explores the climate crisis in the Arctic and a yet to be published story that's called Vanishing Caribou. This was written by Neil Shea and I've been working on it for National Geographic over the last two years, um, actually up until a few days ago. But um, it's something that I've been dreaming about photographing ever since my first trip up north, which is where this story begins. So uh, in 2014, I got a completely random assignment to photograph a thousand mile sled dog race. Up until that point, I had been covering international news and conflict, mostly in Latin America for about a decade. Uh, and I had never imagined myself working in the Arctic wilderness. But the minute I arrived up north, I was blown away. It was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. And I was experiencing it through this incredible relationship between people and animals, in this case, sled dogs but I soon learned that this was just one tradition stemming from an entire way of life for indigenous communities in the Arctic. Places that I've been returning to for almost a decade where the calendar year revolves around subsistence hunting. And so I did not grow up going hunting or fishing or mushing in the outdoors. I did not grow up in Stevens Village at all. Um, I grew up in New York City. So this is a place, you know, food comes from plastic containers and dogs are pets. And I'd also never seen the day-to-day -day realities of climate change firsthand. But in every village I visited along that first sled dog race, people would tell me stories about how trails were melting or how all the dog food was spoiling. And then later in coastal communities like Kotzebue, Alaska, in this photo here, um, I'd learned about how challenging and dangerous hunting had become. So I felt like I was finally starting to understand the enormity of what's happening to our planet so what began as a random assignment uh, became a life-changing new focus. And since then, I've been working to tell stories that explore how the climate crisis is transforming the relationship between people, animals, and the land. Um, oh wait, so in that last photo, this is uh, Leo Sage. So he's in Utkiavik, and he had just returned to town after hunting bearded seals with his dad. But that uh, June, there were absolutely no bearded seals because as the sea is getting warmer, the migration patterns of all of these animals are changing and they've become really unpredictable. And uh, this is Quincy. He's a uh, Inupiaq whaling captain, also in Inupiaq. And so for thousands of years, Inupiaq community members in what's now called Alaska's North Slope have hunted bowhead whales. And the annual spring whale hunt is still the lifeblood of their community. And now climate change is threatening this tradition in a number of ways. For one, it's become increasingly dangerous to travel and camp on the sea ice as more and more of it melts. This is Josiah. He's a younger member of Quincy's whaling crew, and uh, he's taking a break after stacking meat in his family's ice cellar. So ice cellars are generations old, massive underground freezers that are dug deep into permafrost. And as permafrost thaws, these ice cellars are melting and flooding and destroying the food that communities depend on for the year to come. You know, this is a place you can't have a chicken coop or uh, you know, a garden. Uh, they really depend on all of these hunted foods. And then this means that people have to store food in freezers or outside, which attracts bears. And bears are hungrier than ever, as we all know, as the sea ice melts, it makes it harder for them to hunt seals. So climate change is forcing these bears to interact with humans more and more, which is dangerous for humans and also for bears. If there's a bear wandering around, uh, you know, a schoolyard, it's gonna get shot. So, after about five years of working and teaching in Alaska, I'll talk a bit more about teaching at the end. Um, 
I received my first big National Geographic assignment. And it was about this very subject, permafrost. And so just for those of you who don't know, because I actually really didn't know much about permafrost until I started working on this story, permafrost is a layer of continuously frozen soil that covers about a quarter of the Earth's surface. And most permafrost areas have been frozen for more than 10,000 years, which means that it contains 10,000 years worth of built up carbon dioxide and methane, methane which is 20 times more potent than CO2. And so Arctic permafrost is thawing much faster than expected, and if it reaches a tipping point, the amount of carbon that will be released in the atmosphere would make fossil fuel emissions look like chump change. So um, this wasn't, in the beginning, this wasn't a dream assignment, right? I'm like, okay, so it kind of looks like mud, and it's underground, and it hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, I love photographing people, and I was not really excited about this assignment, but I wanted to find a way to just be able to express the urgency of what's happening to permafrost thought, even though it's a slow-moving crisis. So one of the ways was, um, was this. As I'm sure the person from Stevens Village knows, this is like something that people will do for fun in the winter. But as permafrost thaws beneath lakes and ponds, it releases these methane bubbles into the water. So if you punch a hole through the ice, the gas escapes, and you can light it on fire. So scientists at University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, where I was working, will use this to measure rates of permafrost thaw in certain places. And so the other way I felt like I was able to express the urgency of permafrost thaw was by visiting the Batagaika crater in Siberia. This crater is roughly half a mile long and 300 feet deep. And it started forming in the 1960s when nearby forests were clear cut, and it's just growing bigger and bigger. And you can see and hear massive chunks of earth falling, when you're there, it's, um, yeah, it's pretty wild. And so it's also one of the few places in the world where you can study a wall of permafrost up close. So that's like 200,000 years of climate history and information within the permafrost of this crater. And when I was there, you could see woolly mammoth vertebrae just on the ground. Um, yeah, something really incredible, but also really scary. Um, and I think you've been talking about this a bit. You know, I, I think it's important to always include an element of hope or innovation in climate stories so it's not too much doom and gloom and you don't alienate people. And for this, um, I was really inspired by um, this man. This is a Russian permafrost scientist, Sergei Zimov. So he has this nature reserve slash scientific experiment that some of you might have heard of called Pleistocene Park. It's in northeastern Siberia. So Zimov believes that if you recreate the ecosystem of the Pleistocene era, which was dominated by grasslands and large grazing mammals, you can slow down permafrost thaw because grass absorbs less sunlight than heat of the heat of trees or tundra. Um, so to test this theory, he imported yaks, bison, moose, and wild horses to the park. And then um, in 2018, he's joined forces with George Church um, at Harvard, who's trying to clone the woolly mammoths. So if they're successful, the woolly mammoths will have a home in Pleistocene Park. And I know this might sound crazy, um, but when you think about it, is it that much more crazy than human beings rapidly transforming our energy system? So whether or not Pleistocene Park is the answer, I feel like it's a, you know, it's a big, bold idea, which we need more of. So now the story that I'm currently working on, Vanishing, Vanishing Caribou. So caribou are the wild North American cousins of an animal most people know, reindeer. The difference between them is about 7,000 years of reindeer domestication. Arctic caribou populations have been in shocking decline. They've gone from a total of 5 million animals 20 years ago to about 2 million today. And there hasn't been a disappearance of so many large land mammals in such a short period of time since the American buffalo. So this is an enormous loss. It threatens to put even more pressure on the fragile interconnected ecosystem of the Arctic and on the communities across Alaska and Canada that depend on caribou, not only for food security, but also culturally and spiritually. People for whom caribou means everything, like the Nunamute community of Anaktuvik Pass, here they are on Easter Sunday. Anaktuvik translates to the place of many caribou droppings, and the village is located right along the migration path for the Western Arctic caribou herd in Alaska's Brooks Range. So at the end of church that day, they prayed both for the community's health and well-being and for that of the caribou and their soon-to-be-born calves. Because even Jesus rides a caribou in Anatomic Pass. <laughs> um, Anatomic Pass was only founded in 1957, when the Bureau of Indian Affairs forced the Nunamut to settle into a single village site. Like so many places across Alaska um, and also in Canada, these are locations where people were forced to live. They didn't choose it. They didn't really get a say in where they chose. And these are the places that are facing the most extreme issues of climate change. 
Um, because so before that, Nunamut were nomadic and their homes and way of life would revolve around the caribou migration. So this is Casey, she's processing a caribou that her brother just hunted for her. Sorry for the vegetarians. Um, and this is her one-year-old daughter, Ellie Lou. She's helping tenderize the meat. So caribou is the single most important source of fresh food and protein in Anaktubic Pass. This is a community located completely off the road system and groceries have to be flown in. This is Mark Morey and his granddaughter, Jade. So Mark was a legendary caribou hunter in his day, and even now he could just look out the window and he'd be able to tell me where the caribou were that day and how they were gonna behave, and he was always right. This was, I was in Anaktubic Pass for about a month and a half, and he always knew exactly what the caribou were gonna be doing. And uh, so Mark is part of the last generation of Nunamut people who lived completely off the land and migrated with the animals themselves. So for as long as Mark could remember, the caribou migration was always the same. Thousands of animals passed through town in the spring and returned in the fall. But for the last five years, they haven't come through in the fall at all. So scientists think this is most likely due to climate change delaying caribou's migratory patterns, which are triggered by weather. But Mark and other community members have a different theory. Nunamute hunters have a sacred tradition, whether it's fall or springtime, to not hunt the first wave of caribou that come through town. This way, the leaders, who are generally healthy females, will make it to the calving grounds successfully, and they'll continue to use the same route year after year. This is species management. Uh, so sport hunters, on the other hand, will ignore this tradition, and they'll end up scaring all the caribou away, shooting whichever animals they see first. So the lack of fall caribou means that the spring hunt is more important than ever, because it's the only opportunity for families to get the meat that's going to feed them, because there's no more fall hunt. So this is Clyde Morey, uh, Mark's son. He was a really skilled hunter like his dad, which was good because temperatures that spring were between negative 30 and negative 60. So only the most experienced hunters could stay safe out there. But what means misery for humans are ideal conditions for caribou. They have an entire circulatory system that's adapted to the extreme cold. And so this is a group grazing on a day when it was so cold that no one would go hunting, not even Clyde. The only person dumb enough to go outside was me. Once it got a bit warmer, the younger, less seasoned hunters, like 12-year-old Gerald here, made their way into the mountains. So after he processed this entire caribou, him and his cousins distributed the meat around town to elders. And I was just super impressed with the kids in Anaktubic Pass. They've got screens and video games at home like kids anywhere else, but have the motivation to get together and go out hunting on their own. The entire community um, in Anaktubic Pass really prioritizes passing on traditional knowledge and skills to the younger generation. So every year they have a special class that teaches caribou butchering and hide processing in school, especially great for those kids that might not have access to traditional knowledge at home. There we go. And so also they're you know, super talented photographers. <laughs> Um, just really tech savvy, so um, you know, whenever I'm in communities, I probably sleep in the school, and so it's a really great opportunity to teach photography to kids. So they've been documenting this past, this was two years ago, so this past year, um, kids in Anaktubic Pass have been documenting the, carib the spring caribou migration that just went on right now, so we're really excited to get their pictures and um, have them be a part of this National Geographic story when it comes out. And then another community I worked in in Alaska is the Netsaikwichin community of Arctic Village. This is another community for whom caribou is really important. They're located along the border of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and they're home to the porcupine caribou herd. This is the only herd in the entire Arctic that isn't in decline, but is actually growing. So I visited Arctic Village during their spring carnival. So this is when the caribou are migrating through town and everyone gets together for games like this bubblegum blowing competition. And then later in the day, a caribou head skinning competition. In Arctic Village, caribou heads and tongues are considered the best and most delicious part of the animal. So the Gwich'in are known as the caribou people. As Gwich'in elder Sarah James said, caribou are not just what we eat, they're who we are. They're in our stories and songs and the whole way we see the world. Caribou are our life. Gwich'in activists like Sarah James have been successful in fighting against oil development and drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge for decades now. And it's curious that the porcupine caribou herd is the only herd that's actually growing. Okay, so now comes some science. I'm just gonna geek out a bit and tell you all about the caribou migration, which is the longest terrestrial migration on the planet, and it can encompass thousands of miles. So at the end of spring, pregnant caribou, like these three, uh, begin their long march toward their calving grounds on the coastal plain. Caribou have a built-in compass, like migratory birds, so they could be spread out 
across hundreds of miles, but when it's time to migrate, they somehow find each other, coming together and moving like a single organism. Caribou have also been following the same migratory routes for millennia, down to the very same trails. And you can see evidence of this in the tundra, where there'll be indentations from their trails that are as deep as a person standing. So by early summer, the caribou have given birth, the snows melted, and the rivers overflow, which doesn't stop these animals from continuing north on their migration. They're going to cross hundreds of rivers, streams, and lakes, but they're excellent swimmers. Their hollow hair helps them float, and their large, wide hooves act as paddles. And also, as they cross the landscape, caribou play a crucial role within the larger Arctic ecosystem. They feed everything from wolves and bears to foxes and hawks, and even tundra mice will get calcium from knobbing on their little um, antler sheds. So, and also, their hooves um, will till the soil and help plants grow. So the following summer, I returned to Nunamut and Inupiaq lands to photograph the Western Arctic caribou herd. The Western Arctic caribou herd was once the biggest herd in the world. Their status is now critical. Since 2003, they've gone from half a million animals to only 188,000, and a quarter of those losses have happened in the last three years. So in, uh, in late July, the herd moves to windy high altitude areas to avoid mosquitoes, and they'll aggregate in groups as large as 50,000. And I tried to photograph this aggregation for years. I hired guides, but the plane would break down, or we just couldn't find the caribou, and it was always a mess. And so this past summer, I made one last attempt. I flew to the Lisburn Hills here, and this is a place where the train's so rugged that um, you can only land a plane that's just big enough for me and my gear. So the plan was, if I could find the caribou, the pilot would drop me off, and I would follow them on foot, and I'd camp and hike until I couldn't keep up, and then he'd pick me up, and we'd do that again. So finally, after years of trying, I think I saw the entire Western Arctic caribou herd. And elders would always talk about how caribou used to be thick as bugs on the landscape, and it was incredible to finally see what they meant. So it's hard to imagine that this many animals could possibly go extinct, but that's the reality we now face. And as we speak, the state of Alaska is still trying to push through the Ambler Road. This is a 211-mile mining corridor that's going to bulldoze right through the Western Arctic caribou herd's migratory path. And, you know, state officials and some scientists won't come out and say it, but all signs point to the fact that a big part of Arctic caribou decline is a direct result of disruptions to the landscape. These are creatures of space. They need big herds to stay safe. They need lots of space to migrate. So things like logging, mining, and oil development have a really big impact. And uh, nowhere has this been more clear than with an almost extinct mountain caribou herds in southern Canada, where logging and mines have torn through habitat. But this doesn't mean there isn't still hope. And so to end, I just want to share two inspiring caribou stories. The Clincy Zock caribou herd used to fill the old growth forests of south central British Columbia, which is home of the West Moberly and Soto First Nations. But 10 years ago, only 16 Clincy Zock caribou remained. So in 2013, West Moberly and Soto dedicated themselves to saving the herd by setting up a maternity pen program. So after capturing and collaring pregnant females in the spring, they relocate them to a large mountaintop enclosure where they can monitor the health of moms and newborn calves and look out for predators. Then, at the end of the summer, once the calves have their legs under them and the mothers are fat and healthy, they're released back in the wild. So this project has been a really big success, and the Clincy Zaws herd has gone from 16 to 114 caribou. And not only that, but the Soto and West Moberly secured a landmark conservation agreement that protects over 3,000 square miles of caribou habitat. And this isn't the only indigenous-led conservation initiative breaking ground in Canada. So for thousands of years, the Clicho have hunted the Bathurst caribou herd in Northwest Territories. And sadly, this herd has already almost completely collapsed. And in 2015, the tribal government made the difficult decision to institute a hunting ban. But they didn't let this sever their ties with the animal. Instead, they began a groundbreaking community science program called Boots on the Ground. And this program brings elders, community members, and youth together to study the caribou using interdisciplinary research techniques, tracking, counting, and photographing the animals in order to manage the species with their own data, not just the government's. So the Clicho are one of the first indigenous communities to officially co-manage an entire species with the Canadian government, but they're part of a growing indigenous movement like that of Soto and West Moberly First Nations to save species, preserve landscapes, and return ecological stewardship to indigenous people. 
And working on this story, it's become clear that if we want to save the caribou, we have to look to and listen to the people who know them best. And these are just some of the amazing pictures that the folks that are part of the Boots on the Ground program have taken. Um, yeah, their monitoring work and their science work has been really incredible. So um, we have to figure out exactly how we're going to incorporate all of this into the story. Um, but yeah, so I'm really excited for this caribou story to come out. I think hopefully in a couple months, we'll see. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Well, first of all, uh, it's amazing what you do and the eye that you have, and I want to ask you a little bit about that. But I also want to make a very important point here that I think we all saw, which is stories of hope. You talked about that, and we started this morning hearing Ed Maybach talking about that. There is so much to be hopeless about <laughs> seeing these stories, hearing what communities are doing. It's important, and it, it actually uh, is inspiring. Uh, first, on the storytelling. Um, do you use drones, or is that yeah. all you standing on top of a mountain? I use a lot. So this is the thing. So there's so much mosquitoes, um, you know, in the summer, and so the sound of a drone to a caribou kind of sounds like a mosquito. So they don't really mind it. You have to you have to be so careful with drones because there's such a you could definitely harass the animals if you're not careful. So but so I do use drones um, when possible, but only with animals um, that are extremely comfortable around them, like caribou. Part of uh, what we're talking about, we've spoken about this a, a lot today in a lot of different contexts, is the diverse voices that we're trying to tell stories about, stories with, stories through. Uh, how do you grant agency, and how do you respect the cultures and the people who you are dropping in on and yeah. photographing? I mean, it's, it's and is like, that a negotiation? How do absolutely. You do that? I mean, it's such, I mean, I love nothing more than getting to work in these incredible places um, and you know and it's wonderful but it's always you know it's always with permission and it's always with not just permission but invitation um, and long long-term work you know it's not just one trip so none of the places where I work I'll only have gone there once um, and it just you just have to be invited in if people want want to bring an outsider in to do this kind of work and if they don't then you don't go, or if there's like, you know, some stories where there's somebody that makes much more sense to tell it that's from there, which I think, I think like the days of someone like me telling these kind of stories are probably over, you know, just from all of these kids that I'm, you know, teaching, they're all so talented, they're going to be the ones to tell these stories in the future. So I think, you know, it's um, just sort of every, every instance is different, so just kind of trying to do right by people and just tell the story in the way that they want it told. I wonder if you could take us into the conversation. I mean, we've really had, we've, we've actually had a conversation here that, in previous years called Who Can Tell My Story? So if you're a white person reporting on a community of color or you're a non-indigenous person in, uh, visiting an indigenous community or vice versa for that matter, um, how do you become, what does that conversation sound like where you become culturally aware and respectful so that you can accurately and comfortably tell the story, and so that the community has confidence in you as a storyteller to correctly portray it. Yeah, I mean, mostly listening and listening well, right? What does that mean? I think, um, I don't know, reading between the lines, like sometimes people don't say no. It's not something that they do culturally, and like as, you know, someone from New York City, that's not part of my culture, so I have to recognize and Forget actually, about oh, it, right? oh, maybe somebody <laughs> isn't interested in this. They're just so kind that I can't tell. So I don't know. I think things like that, but also um, there's lots of super talented indigenous photographers in Alaska who, um, you know, who I'll talk to before doing work, or sometimes I'll travel with them when we teach, and um, will kind of, you know, help me navigate things that I might not know. And then, um, and then, you know, I was teaching at UAF for a while, and it's been about 10 years working there. And I still have a ton to learn. But I don't know. I think it's like if you show up really willing to learn, um, it's, it's pretty incredible, um, you know, the kind of people that you'll be able to meet. How many photographers are in the room? Okay. How many people have taken pictures? How many people have posted pictures in your, through your social media? How many people uh, have used images in any kind of storytelling you've done? All right. So how about a little advice uh, to people who have done this a little and some who've done it more from someone who does it all over the world. What do you look for? Some of your pictures are big and wide and the color is bold and bright. Some of them are very tight and intimate. How, what, when you see something through your camera, how do you say, 
I want that. Well, there's one thing is just don't ever see a photo and say, I'll go back. That's just, you know, if you see something incredible and you want to take that picture, take the picture then and there. Obviously not if it's of a person. You have to get a person's permission before you photograph them. But that's just one thing. And it's like the camera that you have on you, not some fancy camera that you think you should use or that you maybe don't even know how to use yet. So, I mean, people take amazing photos. Oh, wait, is there... Um, Oh yeah, so this is another, these are some other photos. And these are kids like, I mean, gosh, they were so young. This is in Shishmaref. This is a community that folks of you from Alaska know. It's been very reported on. So it wasn't a place that I felt like it was, um, I wanted to take pictures in, but we did some workshops there. And, um, and yeah, and they got, these kids got their photos published in the newspaper. And then um, we made this Instagram account and this Facebook page. Um, yeah, so I think I just like, they're gonna see things that I'd never see. So I think, you know, People just like photographing what you know is one thing. And then if you're off somewhere new and exciting, just, yeah, just take lots of pictures. Like, don't be shy, I think. You're not shy. No. Okay. <laughs> Katie, thank you so much for coming, for coming all the way here. For this. All right, we're going to take a break in just a minute.